Welcome to the podcast of the Consortium for History of Science, Technology, and Medicine. I'm Bob Akashrafi. Today, we're speaking with James Poskett, who is Assistant Professor in the History of Science and Technology at the University of Warwick. James is the author of Materials of the Mind, Phrenology, Race, and the Global History of Science, 1815 to 1920. James, thank you very much for joining us to talk about your book, Materials of the Mind. You're welcome. Your book covers the history of phrenology as a science of the mind that spans the world and runs from the early 19th century to the early 20th century. So to get us started, why don't you describe what is phrenology? Phrenology was an incredibly popular science of the mind in the 19th century and now considered completely defunct, the ultimate pseudoscience. And the basic belief that phrenologists had was that the mind was something material, that it was located in your brain, which seemed pretty radical at the time, if though reasonable to us. And the other thing that phrenologists believed was that the shape of the brain in some way matched the skull. So therefore, they believed that you could read someone's mental character from the shape of their head. And that's the classic image we associate with phrenology. It's the thing we find ridiculous today that you might be able to read something about someone's mind, their character from feeling their skull. But that's what many people, uh, including many respectable people, as well as completely non-respectable people, uh, believed in the 19th century. James, how did phrenologists learn about the shapes and the textures of skulls that they wanted to study from all over the world? So phrenologists in lots of different parts of the world enacted mass schemes to collect skulls, um, but particularly phrenological societies in European and American cities in places like Edinburgh, Paris, Philadelphia. They amassed these large collections of skulls, often sent by colonial officers, sometimes by slave traders, from different races of man, as they would have called them. And these skulls arrived in various conditions, in somewhere like the Edinburgh Phrenological Museum. And the phrenologists then would feel the skulls for texture. They would measure the skulls using calipers, uh, very precisely to try and ascertain which different parts of this skull corresponded to different organs of the mind, whether that person might have been particularly intelligent, whether they might have had a particular talent for music, whether they might have been aggressive or a criminal. And then they would often compare skulls as well. So they would compare these different skulls from different parts of the world and make claims about the racial character of different peoples, whether that was an Inuit from the Arctic, or whether that was someone from South Asia, lots of skulls were collected from India, whether that might have been an enslaved African. And they used these skulls to make often highly racialized claims about the character of these individuals. When they made these comparisons, between skulls from peoples and races around the world and made claims about them. What kind of claims were they making and how did the science of phrenology affect relationships or understandings between different races? So maybe a good way to answer this question is to think about the specific claims that phrenologists often made about African peoples in, of course, an age in which slavery was still very much part of the Atlantic world uh, in the first decades of the 19th century, but also an age in which the abolition movement was growing, the abolition of slavery first in Britain in 1833, and then later in the United States following the Civil War. So there's a particular example of this that I talk about in, in the book, and that's a plaster cast that was taken of a Haitian slave who was named Ustash Balan. And Ustash was born into slavery on the Caribbean island that was then called San Domingue, um, now Haiti. And he lived through the Haitian Revolution, which took place at the end of the 18th century. 
And somewhat incredibly, he escaped the Haitian Revolution and arrived in Paris in the early 19th century. And at this time, Paris was really one of the centers for phrenology. And one of these French phrenologists took a plaster cast of Eustache Belin's head when he was still alive. This plaster cast really became the center for phrenological debates about African racial character. And unsurprisingly, I guess, it therefore was deployed in arguments both for but also against the abolition of slavery. And in my book, I explore how in different places in the Atlantic world, different people with different political backgrounds read very different things into the character of this one uh, African man. So in France, where really the July monarchy of the 1830s wasn't particularly interested in abolishing slavery, Eustache Belin's bust was often held up as an example of why slavery effectively needed to continue. So he was thought of as this particularly remarkable man. He had a particularly large head. He was deemed to be particularly intelligent. But the French phrenologists would say things like, well, this is proof that whilst the African people, the enslaved people, could be improved over a long period of time, in fact, they're not, quote unquote, ready for freedom. And so Stash Balan's bust was used by phrenologists and effectively pro-slavery campaigners to try and maintain slavery. Whereas a few years later, I found that a copy of this bust had been actually purchased in Paris by a group of New York abolitionists. And they had drawn almost the opposite conclusion. So they had taken this bust of this man who was born in Haiti, died in Paris, and now his bust is in New York. And they were using this bus to argue really strongly that the United States needed to abolish slavery. And this was before the Civil War. And this was an argument based on trying to undermine racist notions of the inferiority of African character. So Ustash Balan was presented as this incredible man who had incredible intellectual abilities. He was also particularly uh, thought of as benevolent because he'd saved his master, allegedly in the middle of the revolution. And so the American abolitionists take completely the opposite stance and use Eustache Balan's bust as really an icon for the need to abolish slavery. So the lesson there, I think, is the ways in which these arguments about racial character, on the one hand, were really clearly grounded in this racist world of Atlantic slavery. But on the other hand, were also used as part of the abolitionist movement. They could be put to both political ends in this period. In your book, you talk about samples, about skulls and casts, but also interpreters of phrenology from all of the inhabited continents. How did phrenologists share their knowledge and the practices that they were developing with each other across these vast distances? So the 19th century was really a period in which communication networks became industrialized, in which the media became industrialized. And for me, this is one of the reasons why phrenology becomes this global science. So I've talked quite a lot about some of the things we might expect from phrenologists, that they collected skulls from colonial places, that it, phrenology was wrapped up with debates about Atlantic slavery. But phrenology was soon spreading to the colonies, to the Atlantic world, where it was taken up by lots of different kinds of people. And this in part was because things like steamships were reach, reaching India, importing new books. This was in part because you could send a letter from the United States to Britain, from even somewhere like Australia to Europe in a matter of weeks. In my book, I look particularly at how phrenology was taken up by a group of colonized Indians in Calcutta in the 1840s and 50s. And they were sending letters to leading European and also American phrenologists they were importing books uh, from Europe and the United States as well. And they were also collecting skulls and making their own phrenological museums. 
And for me, this was a really good example about how this essentially European idea about the nature of the mind, which was very closely linked to race, could be taken up by a group of colonized people and effectively turned against the colonial state. So this group of Indian phrenologists found the Calcutta Phrenological Society, and they're writing back and forth to phrenologists around the world, they're collecting these books, and they start making claims about the character of what they call the Bengali people, and they particularly claim that there's a need for religious and educational reform. They think they need new schools, they think that Christian missionaries are doing a lot of harm to colonial Indian society. Uh, They're also actually very critical of the conservative Hindus in Calcutta as well. And they're drawing on these European ideas, they're often mixing it with political ideas, they're drawing on socialism, on liberalism, and they're mashing it all together to create this critique of the colonial state. But they're only able to do that because of this connected world. There's a kind of irony to this as well, in that this critique of the colonial state is in part only made possible through the kinds of connections, the industrialized communication networks that empire brings. I don't think it's a coincidence that this phrenological society is established in Calcutta, which is really the second city of the British Empire, where you can read books and journals published just a few weeks before in somewhere like Britain or Paris, thousands of miles away in South Asia. So these connections, I think, are really important for explaining both the reach of phrenology, but also the kinds of political uses it gets put to. I guess another side to that is the way in which phrenology enters prisons. So the 19th century is a period really in which prisons expand across the world, particularly in the United States and in prison colonies in places like Australia. And it's also a period in which there are new experimental prisons, tests with things like isolation and silent systems. And what I found in the course of researching my book was that many of these prisons, for instance, Pennsylvania State Penitentiary in Philadelphia, had phrenologists in them. They were often run more or less explicitly along phrenological principles. And this, again, wasn't a coincidence. It was a product of the way the world was connected. People were sharing ideas about how criminality might be located in the mind. Again, something we find pretty suspicious, pretty troubling today. But this was an idea that was spreading around the world And if you were a phrenologist running a prison in Philadelphia, you could be reading about and corresponding with someone as far away as a Pacific prison colony about the nature of criminality and how a new prison system might help you reform society. Should we understand phrenology as something that was mostly engaged in by experts and practitioners and scientists? Or was there a broader cultural reach and impact? I think probably the most exciting thing about phrenology, uh, maybe historically, but also at the time, was the breadth of people it was taken up by. So on the one hand, you get people that are absolutely experts in the scientific and medical profession. Many of the phrenologists, particularly in Edinburgh and Paris, which were centres for the study of medicine in the early 19th century, they were really well-respected physicians. On the other side of the spectrum, you get phrenologists who we might now think of as quacks, as people on the street peddling suspicious remedies. You get a lot of interest in phrenology amongst the working classes, really around the world, but particularly in Britain and the United States. So working class organisations set up phrenological societies in industrialising cities like Sheffield and Manchester, uh, like Boston, and as well as the sort of scientific expertise and the popular side of phrenology, you get a lot of political elites that are interested in phrenology. So Queen Victoria herself actually had her children examined by a phrenologist. A number of American senators in 
the middle of the 19th century, joined phrenological societies. Horace Mann, um, a senator in Boston, joined a phrenological society. So one of the most striking things I think about phrenology more than any other science is how it reaches right across the political spectrum, right across divisions of class, and right across divisions of expertise, and indeed actually right across divisions of race. So even though people of African descent, people in South Asia, were more often than not the subjects of phrenological analysis, perhaps somewhat surprisingly, as I described earlier in Calcutta, but also in the United States, you get African Americans taking up phrenology as a kind of critique of the racism that they've been experiencing. They're using phrenology to try and undermine these racist narratives about the inferiority of African character. And one of the ways I tracked this in the book was to look at popular culture more generally, newspapers, periodicals. If you look in all kinds of places you might not expect to find phrenology, Christian newspapers in the United States, popular magazines aimed at women in Britain, political tracts, published by working class radicals, you find phrenology popping up. And again, I think that's part of this industrializing world in which cheap printed publications are circulating globally. And so you get this really diverse group of people, often on opposite ends of all kinds of spectrums, taking up phrenology. You've told us about the developing communication networks and the communication technology and how those facilitated the spread of phrenology. How did the development of photography, which happened early in the 19th century, and the capacity to exchange photographic images globally affect the production or interpretation of phrenology, either among the practitioners or the subjects of the practice? So photography had a really transformative effect on phrenology. In the early 19th century, phrenologists tried to reproduce images of people and their heads in all kinds of ways. Uh, They took plaster casts, they did drawings, they printed these images. But before photography, there was no reliable means to quickly and accurately reproduce what somebody's head looked like. Whereas the invention of photography, and particularly uh, the new kinds of easily reproducible photographic techniques that develop in the second half of the 19th century, mean that pretty much anyone can go and have their photograph taken. The biggest phrenological publisher in the United States, run by two brothers, Orson and Lorenzo Fowler, started what was effectively a mail-order phrenological service in the 1880s. So what you would do is have a photograph taken. You were advised to have it taken of the front of your head and then another one in profile, a bit like a mugshot. And you were also advised to make sure you weren't wearing a hat or you didn't have too long hair because they needed to be able to see the contours of your head. And then you would send this to the Fowlers and they would respond with a reading of your character. They would tell you what you were like. Uh, They might advise certain careers that you were more suited for. They might also advise on things like marriage. In fact, you might want to send a photograph of your potential spouse as well uh, and be advised on whether you were compatible. And the Fowlers received photographs. Uh, They were based in New York from right across the United States, um, all the way over from the West Coast, and also from around the world. They were actually sent photographs uh, from India and Australia. So on the one hand, photography really collapsed time and space and allowed phrenologists to make readings of people from across the world. Up to now, what I've been describing are effectively willing participants, but there were also a large number of people that were coerced into having their photographs taken, particularly in the colonial world. So at the same time, as the Fowlers are reading phrenological photographs in the United States, anthropologists in places like India are making tribal people pose for photographs, which are also sent back to places like Edinburgh and Philadelphia. And in particular, an Indian army officer took a series of 
phrenological photographs of a tribe called the Todas who live in the Nilgiri Hills in southern India. And he published a book called A Phrenologist Amongst the Todas. And this book was read by many of the most influential evolutionary thinkers of the 19th century. Charles Darwin read it and actually cited it in The Descent of Man. The most important French anthropological evolutionary thinker, Jean-Louis Armand de Catrafage, also owned a copy and translated large portions of it to appear in his own work. And really what I wanted to do in my book was show how in the late 19th century, The circulation of these phrenological photographs to Britain, to France, from India and back again, transformed how phrenology related to evolution. So earlier in the 19th century, claims that phrenologists made about race and character were often quite distinct from claims about the descent of man. Whereas these phrenological photographs start pushing phrenology into the world of evolution. And evolutionary thinkers like Darwin, uh, like Alfred Russell Wallace, start lining up these phrenological photographs next to one another from different peoples from around the world and comparing and contrasting make claims about the origins of man. So there were lots of debates in this period about where exactly mankind might have originated from. And this hill tribe in southern India, the Todas, were thought of as a potential candidate for an earlier race of man, as they were thought of, and perhaps Asia was the cradle of mankind. As it happens, these claims were often also wrapped up with colonial projects. So one of the reasons that the British were particularly keen to describe hill tribes in India as primitive peoples, as early man, was to deny them certain political rights and economic rights with respect to the land. So again, the colonial side of phrenology and the racial and scientific side of phrenology were all wrapped up, and particularly in these photographs. In your book, you show the connections between many local stories to tell a global history of a science of the mind that involves circulation and exchange of material objects. What lessons do you have for us about the terms local and global and their relationship and how we might understand those terms in the history of science? So for a long time, historians of science have done a really good job of showing that science is really the product of particular local circumstances, that Sciences like evolutionary science developed out of the particular intellectual, but also political and social contexts of somewhere like Victorian Britain. Similarly, in the 20th century, we might think about how historians of physics have showed that the particular theories that physicists developed and the particular uses that physics was put to were the product of local political and institutional cultures like the context of the Cold War in the United States. So local is really how the sciences are thought of often by historians. But of course, scientists have a slightly different idea about what science is about. They think of sciences as global in two respects. One, in that science is something particularly today that is fundamentally an international global endeavour. It involves working with people from across the world. And then the second way in which scientists think of science as global is that it's universal and that it works everywhere. That's the special thing about science is that Newton's laws don't just hold for a particular local time or place, that they are universal, they're global, they work everywhere. So what I was really interested in is After really a generation of historians of science focusing on the local aspect of science, I wanted to think about, well, what about the other side? What about the global? But I didn't just want to show that science went everywhere and worked everywhere. What I really wanted to show is how those ideas came about and how it came to be that science was so connected and how it came to be that science was thought of as something universal and global. 
And my answer to that had something to do with the world of communication and industrialization. I think there's a longer process here that stretches back at least to the early modern world of empire. But the particular moments in which science becomes this globally connected and universally applicable endeavor, one of those key moments is the 19th century when communication networks become industrialized. And really the the killer here is that the very word global in the 19th century undergoes a radical change of meaning. If you said global to someone around 1800, they wouldn't think you meant something universal. They would think you mean something spherical, as in globular. Whereas if you said global to someone around 1900 at the end of the 19th century, then they would understand what you mean in the contemporary sense, that when I say something is global, I mean it is universal, it is universally distributed, or that it works everywhere. So that change in what something meant to be global, I think, is a product of these 19th century communication networks. And so my aim was to show how those networks were built, but also the limits to them, that even by the end of the 19th century, and even with these claims of universality and globality, there was always a limit. Even phrenology didn't go everywhere, and it didn't work everywhere. Plaster casts could break. Even these photographs that I described as so powerful, they were often really hard to interpret. They were blurry. Uh, Early photographs were also produced on glass plates, so would also sometimes be damaged in transit. So I wanted to get this balance between telling a story of how science became global, whilst also at the same time recognising the limits to the globalisation of science. James, as you reflect back on the history that you've written about in the 19th century, Are there contemporary resonances or insights or questions that they might raise for us now? Yes, I think there are a number of contemporary um, kind of parallels with phrenology. On the one hand, clearly phrenology is this science which is now completely defunct. It's thought of as a pseudoscience, amusing. We know that the skull does not map the shape of your brain. We know that there are no real biologically meaningful differences between human races. Yet, we live in a world in which particularly biological notions of race deployed by political actors seem to be on the rise. So part of what I think it's important to look back on is how in the past these pernicious notions of race and mental character were deployed and developed and became so powerful. Because the very fact that phrenology, something we laugh at now, was taken seriously by so many people across the world and put to sometimes benign but often really problematic political uses should give us pause for thought in the 21st century when uh, in Britain we've had a recent scandal involving um, the government in which an advisor was appointed who had made uh, various scientifically inaccurate claims about IQ and race. Uh, And in many other countries around the world, political leaders are promoting the idea of an essential uh, human difference grounded in biology. Now, nowadays, the language of that is often genetic, um, whether that's attempts to enforce genetic divisions in somewhere like India, whether that's racial discrimination in the United States. But I think this broad notion that somehow you can read bodies to tell you something about character is something that's on the rise and that we should be resisting against. And I think the history that we see in the 19th century should give us pause for thoughts for thinking about that. Terrific. Thank you. James, I very much enjoyed reading your book and talking with you today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. It was a real pleasure. This has been a podcast from the Consortium for History of Science, Technology and Medicine. 
and I'm Lawrence Kessler, a program coordinator at the Consortium. You can find other podcasts, video lectures, archival spotlights, as well as other opportunities to connect to our community of scholars at chstm.org. This podcast is made possible with the generous support of the Pew Charitable Trusts, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and the Rita Allen Foundation. Thank you for listening.